So this is a video, two minute video from our sponsor that we're grateful for having them here with us as well. So please watch this video. Buildings, an essential element to our everyday. Some built for safety, security and comfort. Some built for learning, growth and a rite of passage. Others for our hour of need, aiding respite, recovery and recuperation. For some, they are inhabited sculptures. Others, where the heart is. We get buildings. We understand their many differences. We appreciate their individual wants and needs. But ultimately, we know how important they are to you and your clients. For us, it's much more than just keeping the cold out and heat in. It's about creating peace and quiet and peace of mind through an unrivaled combination of thermal, acoustic and fire performance, creating warmer places to work, quieter places to rest, and safer places to live. We're not one size fits all. We are the only UK manufacturer of both glass and rock mineral wool, holding the best possible Green Guide ratings, enabling us to offer the right product at the right time for the right bill. That's also right for the future. Together, we have one home and one chance to look after it. Our heritage has been built on efficiency and quality, using local expertise passed down through generations. Who are we? We are Knauf Insulation. So for those of you who are here for the first time, where does the collaborative fit in? Well, the Living Future Collaborative is, if you like, for easier reference, like does work under the auspices of the International Living Future Institute, basically an advocacy work that we're doing. And we are collaborating with the Institute and collaborating with the different partners uh, who are part of the collaborative or interested in the subject of regenerative design. And these are some of the products that they have where they've created this ecosystem to enable living buildings. And the flagship project is program that they have is the Living Building Challenge. And then beyond one building, there's the Living Community Challenge, the Living Product Challenge, and, and, and so on. So we, later on, we're going to, well, later in the year, we've got an introduction to the Living Building Challenge, which we'll tell you more about so that you can uh, get to learn a little bit of what some of these labels mean and what do these um, uh, products mean. So we're going to see an explanation in almost real time on a real project, on a case study, on how you know the living building challenge was applied there. And they'll be able to unpack certain aspects thereof. So if we're interested in the process of getting there, We'll be able to ask some questions in that regard. If we're interested in some of the structure and application of the program itself, we'll be able to get some understanding on that. So this is to show you the different components that of the Living Future Network. So we've got the collaborative facilitators, that's Marlus and yours truly. And we've got uh, a total of four Living Future accredited professionals who are moving into becoming ambassadors and and so we've got uh, Adri Furi, uh, Michelle Ludwig and and then the two collaborative facilitators that you see there and we know there'll be more there are more folks who have started doing the the living future accreditation getting that and so they're doing the courses and everything and we'd love to see much much more people doing this and if you are joining us from outside of South Africa we encourage you to start a collaborative there. So from wherever you are and feel free to get in touch with us uh, and what you're doing. So really part of this network. In fact, that network is what enabled this here conversation to be able to take place. It's because of, of that international network that we are a part of. So now I'd like to hand over to Erica or Megan 
thank you very much for joining us. Thank you once again, and we look forward to your presentation. And the way it is structured, maybe I'll leave that to you in how the, the presentation is structured and where the video would, would, would fit in. So over to you. Thank you. So this is Architectural Nexus. This is our Sacramento, California location. Architectural Nexus is a design firm or an architecture firm that is headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. We have a secondary location in Sacramento, California. Our Sacramento, California location is a certified living building. It is number 19 out of 25 in the entire world. It was the first living building in California. And it was the first one in the entire world to be a regenerative retrofit building. So we we did the ultimate sustainability and we recycled a building. And yeah, and our Salt Lake City office is currently undergoing construction and is a registered living building 4.0 project. So uh, Megan, anything else we want to add to that? Yeah, we'll have to come back for a presentation too sometime after the summer, whenever our Salt Lake City office is completed. But we have lots of lessons learned from our Sacramento office that we've been applying to other projects and our office. Excited to dig in. So here's kind of our agenda. Our We did do a video tour of the Sacramento office, which will play kind of after our PowerPoint presentation and we left Q&A for the end because we're hoping that there's a lot of questions. It's much easier to answer questions as they come, but in this case where it's kind of spread out, we'll wait till the very end. We love questions. Questions are much easier to answer than us trying to remember every little detail. So if you have questions, write them down and we'll answer them all at the end here. This is a before photo of our Sacramento location. So you can see from the previous photo that we showed with the title slide, this is a much different building. This building was built in 1954. <clears throat> it was an old print shop. So they, you know, printed large banners and things like that. So they had tons of printer ink and oil and all kinds of things that were just all over the floor. And, you know, this, there were no windows in that building. The trees were all overgrown, but the location of this building was ideal for us. Part of the living building challenge is that you have a building that is centered in you know place for us in sacramento there is a thing called historic r street so you can maybe see in the photo there's some railroad tracks kind of going oop, down through the center there this used to be an industrial corridor in sacramento back you know when it it first was settled and so they've they've really made this area of Sacramento a really a historical site and this building just didn't really fit in with that area. So obviously this is our after photo. The building is very different. You can see we have lots of windows and parts and pieces of the building have been turned and shifted and we've installed, you know, a a bike rack that's an also an art piece. You can maybe see through the window. We have really bright lights in our lobby with a, a living wall, which we'll talk about later, but it's it's a very different building. It's very, it, ver it sticks out really well in the neighborhood, but ultimately it's just a really nice piece to look at and everything in the building has been vetted and it's it's a clean building and occupants like to be in it. So that is our after photo. This is a, sh a photo of, you can kind of get an idea of the back part of our building. So 
We do have two rainwater cisterns, which we'll talk about there in a minute. But in this photo, what I kind of wanted to focus on was our PV arrays. You know, for the Living Building Challenge Energy Pedal, you have to meet, uh, this project is certified under 3.1 version, which the energy pedal has not changed very much um, with the new 4.0 version, but you have to meet 105% of energy. So you have to be a net positive building, not just net zero. And in this case, ArchNexus Sacramento has 305 solar panels for our building, which is only about 8,000 square feet. So 305 is a lot. We weren't totally sure how much PV we were gonna need to meet that requirement. And then what ultimately ended up happening was we added a contingency to our PV array and then our engineer added a contingency and then our PV installer added a contingency. And ultimately what we ended up with is we produce 175% of the energy that we need. So we could almost power two buildings with our one building. But that's okay. We we put it all back onto our local, you know, utility district grid. We get a credit every year. And at the end of the year, we get, you know, a large check that ultimately we work toward paying off our, our PV system. I will say that as the person that has to perform the maintenance on this building, most of our PV panels sit flat on our roof, as you can see. We do have that canopy that kind of hangs over our parking lot, but our PV, most of our PV is flat. And we do have those trees on the sides and they get lots of leaves under them. And, you know, I will go up there in the rain with a squeegee and clean them so that I can use as much free water as possible. But they are a little bit harder to maintain because they do have to sit flat at that angle. It's a 100 kW system and it's tied to a saltwater battery backup system within our building, which we'll talk about in a little bit. This is kind of what the inside of our office used to look like. So you can see it's just kind of some pillars and a drop down ceiling and the floor is just concrete that has stains all over it. And, you know, there's just a lot going on here that wasn't working with our our design aesthetic you know a lot of what we wanted to create was a healthy indoor environment for occupants and this didn't fit that bill so we changed um this is the same view from the after so you can see it's quite different we did ultimately keep a lot of that concrete flooring the living building challenge is, is pretty stringent on materials and there's not a lot of polish you can put on your concrete that will meet the red list requirement. And so this is kind of what we ended up with and it's kind of an industrial look and you know you can see our, our rainwater pipes going through the ceiling there and we have some duct socks and solar tubes which ultimately end up helping us in the energy pedal as well as you know they create more of a healthy indoor environment when we're bringing in natural daylight and it and it helps the occupants feel a little more connected to the outside which is the goal so this is this is what our office looks like today for the most part um, our living wall is a little bit overgrown because of the pandemic no one has been back in the office for a year so it's a it looks a little bit different but we're hoping to get back this summer Megan so this is, so this basically, is basically our certificate, our certificate that, that uh, Architecture Nexus has, Nexus achieved, has the achieved the living building the challenge, building challenge. And it's a 3.0 version. version we met the requirements, the requirements of the place water energy health and happiness materials equity and beauty pedals so this plaque is probably the 
the final thing that you get in your project that you're you love in living building you have to wait a year after you're occupying the building to show actual data we're going to kind of go in through a bunch of the systems that we have installed and some of the challenges and some of the successes that we learned throughout that year and are currently learning i think we have a living future ambassador in every off in both offices so we have i think two in california and then four in the salt lake city at the moment and it's more than just a plaque on the wall. It's a way of life. And we have tested it out on our buildings. And we love what the living building stands for. And we also love being able to show clients that we can operate and run our own building this way. So it's a way that we can test and show clients, you know, the successes and what works and what's a struggle. And we know the actual costs of the systems. Um, our office uses the LG, the VRF system, which is the variable refrigerant flow system. It's an efficient system. It helps us to keep the temperatures in the office well distributed. You'll see in the video, we also utilize operable windows and operable skylights to ventilate the office when we are allowed to. There's a picture in the middle and there's a small indicator light. Uh, that light is tied to a temperature sensor on our roof. When the temperature and the humidity are optimal outside, the light turns on to let occupants know that it's okay to turn mechanical systems off and open the windows and skylights for passive cooling. We're also required to check the outdoor air quality before we open the windows to make sure that we're not letting in bad air quality polluted or if it's smoky from wildfires. But the operable windows are a very good energy saver. Sacramento's climate is very ideal. Even when it's warm, we can keep the building cool and vice versa. If it's colder outside, we can keep the building warm. The temperature is much milder. Um, Utah, we have a little bit more of temperature spikes as it can get very cold. I don't know if you can see outside, there's lots of snow or it can also be very hot. So as Megan was talking about, we have our mechanical system, which utilizes a MERV 13 filter because we're in California and California in the past has faced some major drought issues, which, you know, in turn, unfortunately causes kind of some consistent wildfires in California. We've had a wildfire uh, we call it wildfire season, wildfire season every year. Sacramento is centrally located in these wildfire prone areas. And so unfortunately, every summer we end up with more than one wildfire in our location. Because of that, we've had to introduce, um, you can see the backside of this filter has a black layer that is a carbon filter and we've had to introduce that into our mechanical system simply because of wildfire smoke and it's it's a hard lesson that we had to learn as we were going we had a very devastating wildfire one year in california that created a such a smoky environment within sacramento during our living building challenge performance period actually and it became very difficult for us to pass an indoor air quality test because of these fires. And, you know, ultimately we had to write that in a narrative to International Living Future Institute and let them know, hey, you know, we're facing apocalyptic uh, wildfire smoke here and, you know, we're unable to successfully achieve a, an indoor air quality test. and. You know, we kind of waited until that that smoke subsided and ultimately we did pass an indoor air quality test, but it was uh, a lot of it had to do with adding an additional carbon filter to our mechanical system. These are our two rainwater cisterns. Arch Nexus Sacramento has two 5,000 gallon cisterns. Sacramento only gets rainfall from September to May each year. The rest of the year is dry. The rainwater that we have in these cisterns is currently only used to water our exterior urban agriculture. And we use most of it throughout the year um, during the dry season to sustain our urban ag. 
Um, so before moving into our office to work on the rainwater to potable water system, this was, I think, is the hardest system in most places to get installed. We had to work with the local, think, so the county, and then the state officials to try to get our rainwater to potable water system permitted. The county level is more your local. They told us to go to the state. State sent us back to county. County sent us back to state. So there's a lot of back and forth between them. We were required to hire two separate third party engineers during the process. These were independent of our commissioning agent and anyone else that couldn't be involved in the project. We had to provide a 260 page document stating that we can financially support the system, how we're going to filter it, how we're going to clean it, everything. We worked on this process up until the time we moved into the office. We installed the equipment needed for the system as if it would, you know, move forward with it. And then ultimately the state of California asked us to become our own small water district in order to run the system. So we applied for that. We set everything up, um, proceeded with this whole process until a little bit after we moved in the office, the state of California passed a legislator that changed the um, water districts in California. So at the moment, we're not allowed to run the system as a rainwater to potable. Um, we continue to work on this process with the state and try to help change the policy for the state of California and others to show how we can get this to work. They were worried that we could not filter the system properly and that we could potentially be causing, you know, harmful, harmful, you know, bacteria or something to the tenants. And they won't allow that at the moment. That being said, the state of California does allow black water filtration to potable. So we have been working with them on showing the difference of how rainwater is very different and easier to clean and filter than black water is. Um, so that is a system that we maintain in our office. We show people how to work on it. And we hope that in the future this can change and we can actually be able to use this. In addition, for part of the living future requirement or the living building requirements, all projects have to incorporate a resilient strategy to provide drinking water for up to one week for all building occupants. This has to be done through water storage on site. And then we also have to have a week's worth of food on site for all occupants. So what we have done is I think we have the bottled water at the moment because we were planning on it to be rainwater. So this is one of those lessons learned that we have a week's worth of bottled water for all of our um, building occupants on site. And a question I have, which to me, I think it's the hardest, is do you know what your water system policies are for where you are located or where your projects are located? So that is something to keep in the back of your mind and maybe start looking into that sooner. So this is our gray water side. So our rainwater to potable is right off to the side of this, but this side ultimately processes gray water. So we have several sources where we get our gray water from. We are connected to our city domestic water simply because, again, the state of California won't let us to run rainwater to potable. We receive our water from the city, but we recycle all of that water and turn it into gray water and use it on site. So no water that enters our site actually leaves our site without being cleaned first. So you can see there's various stages of filtration there. This is a non-chemical treated system. So there's no chemicals involved in, in treating this water. It's simply just gravel, sand, a carbon filter, and a small UV light in order to sanitize that water. The city officials in Sacramento do require us to sanitize the water for toilet flushing, which is fine. The UV light does the job. Most places currently flush with drinkable water, which is so silly. I'll show you here. Let's so some of our, our gray water sources, so all the water from our restroom sinks, our showers, our kitchen sinks, our dishwashers, our drinking fountain, and our janitor sink, you know, where we empty the mop water, that all is a source of gray water for us. So 
when we turn on the tap, we get the water to, you know, to wash our hands, then all of that water runs down into our gray water system. We use that water for flushing our toilets, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then we use that water also to water our living plant wall, which we have in the front lobby there. So the living wall is actually a very important part of our, our building's ecosystem. Gray water was an easy one for us to get permitted with our city officials. A lot of, you know, places in California are not unfamiliar with gray water and so that one was the easy part for us. These are our composting toilet units. So we actually compost human waste in our building. These units we have put in another project that we worked on. They have these units in the Bullet Center, which is another living building that's located in Seattle, Washington. These units are pretty easy to maintain. They work just like a normal backyard compost would. They're connected to a vacuum flush toilet, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, so if you've ever been on like an airplane, it's very similar to that, that vacuum flush uh, that an airplane has. We exhaust most of the black water or the liquid from these up through those fans that you can see up through the roof. And then the picture on the right you can see is some of the composting end product. So it just looks like dirt. We have had it tested for a U.S. standard against, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is a, an agency we have here in the U.S., to see where this composting product could be applied. This tests for class A, which means it can go on any public property if we wanted it to. It took about three years for us to get enough composting end product to use. And ultimately we ended up donating this product to an educational farm that's near our building site. So they use that on their farm. This is what our vacuum pump looks like for our toilets. It's a Jets product, which is made out of Norway. It's very easy to maintain. It only has to be taken apart once a year and cleaned. Other than that, it almost never breaks down. And we've had ours for about four years. We're getting ready to install a similar a Jets product, but a bigger pump in our Salt Lake City office. So these are interesting. They use air to move the waste rather than using water. They mix with a little bit of, of water to kind of just keep the, the toilet bowl clean. Put It makes it into a bunch of small pieces, and then it pushes it into our composting bins. So these are very efficient, and they use almost no water, like about... 0.26 liters is all. This is my, uh, my favorite part. I focus a lot on the community resilience as well as building occupant resilience. The intent of the resiliency requirement for the living building challenge is not only to maintain some of the building's programmatic functionality, like during power outages or emergency, but also to ensure that the living buildings serve as a community hub or that they can provide something back to the community. The requirements are you have to remain habitable for one week. And the definition of habitable depends on your occupancy type, your climate of the project. But some of the things that you have to look at are sufficient lighting, heating or cooling to maintain a safe shelter. You don't have to meet the IBC code based for comfort and lighting standards, but you are supposed to meet what you consider a habitable um, version of that. As far as passive survivability, that's really the thermal storage. We have operable windows and the roof vents to ventilate the whole space. And you have to show testing on the coldest and hottest weeks of the year for your project's climate. So we were able to do that easily. We have the energy storage. You heard that we, have, we produce over 175% of the energy use demand. As far as power during, you know, blackout or brownout in your city, you have to be able to maintain the critical loads for one week. And then as far as the community support, they would like it if your project could be designed to be a community shelter in the event of a disaster or coordinate with provide other support. So water, power, food to the community. And this has to be um, accessible for anyone in the community. 
Some of what we have done is we have covered outdoor spaces that have power outlets. I think right now it is not set up on the vampire switch, but where your power outlet, you can flip if it's, you know, if you want it on your batteries, you can turn it so that the community can come out or first responders can start using um, Wi-Fi if it's available or power to charge their personal devices as well as get out of the sun or have a place that you can start distributing food and water. Since we do have the, the bottled water, that's something that we could give away. And our resilience plan for the project, we didn't design it to be um, a community shelter, but that we could aid in any community efforts. We also rent an apartment near the office. That was something that we have in our plan was if during a wildfire, someone's home is not safe and the office is, they could stay at the office. We do have showers, they could come there. So there's a few different things that we could provide for our building occupants, as well as how we provide back to the community. I think Erica told um, a little bit about the wildfires. The biggest concern we have in our Sacramento office is wildfires and poor outdoor air quality. While earthquakes could potentially happen here, it's not as big of a concern as what's going on with all the droughts. We do have the operable windows, which during times when it's not smoky outside or we have good air quality, they're amazing. But that is something that we've had to balance where we have a passive a building that can survive um, over a week on passive systems. But if the conditions are not appropriate, we, can, we would have to use active systems um, and that's going to reduce the, I think we, I don't think we can stay longer than five days with the active systems on the power. So that's something that you need to balance. And that was a big concern with ILFI when we were doing this process is we want to be able to do passive survivability, but there is a point where you have to have active systems. We have car chargers. These are tied specifically to the solar panels. These are available to the public, um, so anyone could charge their cars with this. Um, we also have saltwater batteries. This is tied to the emergency lighting and refrigerators and different, like we can change some of the switches if you wanted to, to see what we could power on. Right now we don't have, I think it's the toilets, the jet systems are not on this, and we can provide one to two weeks worth of power on the batteries, depending what systems we want to plug in. So currently our biggest concern is the server and making sure that our computer servers are working while everyone is um, currently work from home. So that's something that you should, I would highly recommend you consider is a few different scenarios for how your batteries can work and what they can charge during, um, say like a regular time of need when you are working in the office and there's a power outage or if it's a work from home, like we're currently experiencing with COVID-19 um, and have multiple scenarios set up. And it could be worst case scenario to best case scenario. These batteries are pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> the lessons learned is always the fun part. This office is full of lessons learned, but we just picked a few that really highlight a lot of, of kind of what we went through. Um, working with your city or state officials, you know, early and making sure that you're being open and honest with them about everything that you're trying to do. Finding um, an advocate within your local government is is kind of important as well. You know, they really can help you push your building to the next level. Understanding how your PV system is connected. Is it going to go down when you have a power outage because you are grid tied. Can't, you know, do you have those salt water batteries? What's on battery power? Like Megan mentioned, running through different scenarios and understanding how your batteries can work the best for you. In Sacramento, we only have our refrigerator and our emergency lighting tied to these batteries and we are grid tied still. So what happens when our local utility has a power outage, our server is not on those batteries. So our IT people don't even have time to grab the things that they need to from our server before it powers off. We have batteries on our server now, which is a, is a little bit helpful, but they only will last for about 30 minutes. You know, having a secure building envelope 
we had an incident where we purchased a product that we thought would be great for some of our offices in the center of our of our building to allow those offices to bring in natural ventilation from our roof um, and ultimately that product anytime the wind would blow the vent would blow open and then you know windy dusty air would get into the office or they were connected with a soft sock and every time you know, we would have a big storm, the sock would fall down and then air was just pulling, pouring into our office and we couldn't see the sock because it's up on the ceiling. You know, making sure that your building envelope is tight so that when you are utilizing the, the passive systems and the mechanical systems, that those things are accounted for and you're not just letting all of that stuff out into the open. And then one of the last things that we kind of learned the hard way, the very hard way, um, is operable windows and air quality. So just understanding that as much of an energy saver as operable windows are, they can't come at the cost of healthy indoor air quality. So if you're opening up your windows and the air quality is bad, it's, it's not doing anyone a favor. Megan, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I would say start the process, the design process very early. Um, and know that this is what you want to go for prior to even starting concept design. And having this as your goal will help through the design process so much more. If you try to do this as an afterthought, um, or you've already started in schematic design or design development, it's going to be very, very difficult because of the the time requirements that you're going to have to get with permitting and policies with your city and local government organizations, but also like the way you think and design is different. You're looking at a more holistic building where everything is interconnected and works together and the people in the building play a major part. So you can't have a living building unless you, the people in the building are going to be comfortable working um, and operating the building as intended. So I think we often forget that their people play a really big part in operating the buildings, especially the living building. So that's probably my best lessons learned. We can play the video and then do Q&A if you would like to do that. We have a lot of really good questions in the chat. Nexus. Um, we're currently in our Sacramento, California location, which is a certified living building. So we're currently standing in our lobby area, um, which you can see has a large green wall as its main focal point. Um, we actually utilize this wall as a um, path for our gray water system. So we make a little bit too much gray water um, for our toilets to use for flushing. So we utilize this living wall as, as an excess pad for that. Um, this wall waters three times a day for two minutes, just using a drip irrigation through the top. Um, and it's planted into a felt plant media, which allows the water to percolate down. And as long as that felt media stays moist, the plants will survive. Um, you can see that some of the plant species are either a little bit smaller than some or a little bit bigger than some or some might be, you know, kind of looking like they're not doing too great. Um, we actually have turned this wall into kind of a science experiment. Um, we take different kinds of plant species and plant them into the wall to see which ones will survive better um, utilizing gray water. Um, so we can make a comprehensive list of which plants would, you know, thrive in that kind of environment. Since gray water is a little bit salty, um, you know, we add things like an organic salt buster and a little bit of fertilizer to the wall to kind of help those plants survive. Um, you can see that there's grow lights on the top. These are LED. 
Um, and we utilize these at nighttime. So we turn them on for four hours starting at 5 p.m. They run for four hours, then they'll turn off to give the plants that dark period that they need. They'll turn back on at 4 a.m. and they'll be on from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. This kind of helps simulate the, the daylight that the plants need and the sun that they need. Um, since we weren't able to utilize anything like skylights, um, we do have a few, you know, floor to ceiling windows uh, that the plants get some light through, but the majority of the light is fed by these LED lights. So now I'm going to take you into our open office area where we'll talk about some other strategies. Uh, so this is our open office area. As you can see, there's no artificial lighting on in this space at all right now. Um, it's all being daylit by our operable windows, which line the whole perimeter of our building, as well as a solar tube product that we have up on our roof. Uh, the solar tubes take the, the light from the little dome on top of the roof and they refract it down into the space. Um, and this is what our building looks like the majority of the time. Um, we only have the lighting on, uh, you know, in the winter time when it starts to get dark a little earlier. That's the, really the only time we have the lighting on. Um, the other thing we have in this space, and we have it on both sides of our open office areas, is this little light right here on the wall. Uh, when that light turns on, it tells the occupants that it, the temperature and humidity are optimal for them to go ahead and open those windows. Um, I'll show you how the operable windows work, and then we'll talk a little bit about our indoor air quality strategy. Uh, this is one of our operable windows. Um, you can see if you turn the handle uh, one direction, it will go ahead and open the window all the way up so we can get that natural breeze coming through. Um, we are on a major road, so sometimes we do get that traffic noise coming in through the window and it might be a little distracting or a little loud. Um, so we can go ahead and close the, the window, but then turn the handle 180 degrees and open it up through the top. So we still get that natural ventilation coming in through the vent at the top, but we don't necessarily get all the traffic noise. Um, when utilizing the operable windows, the occupants have to check the local weather station's uh, outdoor air quality numbers. Um, indoor air quality is a big important strategy that we try to implement within our building. Um, but when you're on a major road and you have the windows open all the time, you're letting all that bad air into the office and then you're closing it up and the occupants are breathing it in. So the occupants are required to check the outdoor air quality first before opening up those windows. Now I'm gonna take you guys to look at uh, one of our resiliency strategies, which is a battery backup system. So we'll go check out those batteries right now. This is our uh, salt water battery backup system. Um, because of the red list requirements for the Living Building Challenge, we opted to go with a salt water battery system. Um, instead of a lithium ion type system. Um, this system can run our emergency lighting and our refrigerator for a week. Um, in, you know, if we had a bigger system and we're able to allocate more square footage to this system, we could tie our server to it, things like that. Now I'm gonna take you guys into the, our mechanical room to check out our composting toilet system our gray water system, and our future rainwater to potable system. So this is our mechanical room. Um, as you can see, we have composting toilet units on both sides. Um, one side is for our women's restroom, one side is for the men's restroom. Um, we have eight bins total, um, and they actually use a vacuum flush toilet system uh, in order to get the compost product into the bins, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But basically how these bins work, um, they rotate. So one bin is open at a time. So when somebody flushes the toilet, the waste will fall into one bin and then it will the bin will rotate and go to the next bin. Um, 
That way the composting piles remain even. Um, it takes us about three years to get enough composting end product to harvest all of that. And that's simply because our system is oversized for our building. Um, we didn't know at the time that we did this project how many bins we were going to need. Um, and ultimately we figured out that we don't need eight. Um, but nonetheless, we have a lot of composting end product at the end of three years to harvest and donate. Um, these bins have to go through a dry, wet, dry, wet process, just like a regular compost would. Uh, they have to be rotated, um, and I generally rotate those daily. Um, we add wood chips to these bins, um, and then basically our, how our vacuum flush toilet incorporates with this is it uses very little amount of gray water in the toilet. It, that gray water mixes with the waste, but is, but is moved using air, um, similar to a toilet that you would find on an airplane or a cruise ship, it uses that vacuum. Um, it grinds up the waste into pieces, mixes it with that gray water, and then it falls into the bin, mixes with those wood chips, and then gives us this nice end product. Um, I can show you some of the end product and what it looks like. These are the wood chips that we mix with this. Um, I get these for free from our local utility district when they harvest trees around the city. Um, and then this is kind of what the end product looks like. It's just a very dry dirt type material. Um, and this has actually been tested for us. Um, and it's certified under uh, EPA, which is a US standard class A. Um, meaning it can go on a, any public property if they wished to use it as a fertilizer. Um, so it's actually pretty cool. And we donated our first batch of compost to a educational farm in our area. So the other thing that these composting units um, do is because they're doing the decomposition process, it does squeeze out some liquid, which is called leachate. The leachate ends up in this tank, or black water, if you're familiar with black water. Um, it ends up in this tank, and basically what I do is I get a pump and a hose, and I put, make sure that our black water system is closed loop by pumping that black water into the top of the composting unit, um, and that gives that wet factor that the compost needs. Um, so it's just a big loop and a cycle that keeps the black water out of the sewer system as well as gives the compost the liquid nutrient that it needs. This, uh, you can see the composters have these uh, fans attached to the top of them. That's to help exhaust and help evaporate all the black water that ends up in these. So it'll basically just exhaust out through the top of our roof. Um, and that's how we keep our black water level down, um, as well as the smell. So these composters don't smell because the fan is running consistently. Um, so the occupants don't smell any of the composting product that's inside the bin. So this, is, this side of our mechanical room houses our gray water system. So what happens is um, all of the water from our kitchen sink our dishwasher, our showers, and our hand sinks uh, all flow into this underground tank right here. This has a pump inside of the tank, and when there's uh, enough water that it touches the top of a float, what the tank will push it up to this pre-treated tank up here above my head. This tank is gravity fed, so it will sit in that tank while the water waits to be filtered. It will go into this tank first, which is full of gravel. Um, this particular filtration process is meant to mimic a river, so it's no chemicals. Um, so it will go into the gravel filter first. It goes down through the tank and then up through the tank. And then it goes into this second filter, which is full of sand. So again, it's mimicking a river. It'll go down, all the way down through the sand and then back up to the top of the sand. And then when it's filtered enough, it will go into this storage tank right here. Now, this storage tank looks pretty dark, 
but what that is is a bacterial film that grows on the inside of the tank. The water is actually very clean inside, um, and it will sit in this tank until there's demand for the water. So when our living wall turns on or someone flushes the toilet and there's demand for the water, it will go into the pressure tank and then it will go through two more filters in the filtration process. It goes through a carbon filter and then it will go through a UV light as the last process of filtration and then it will go out to the wall or it will go to the toilet. And that is the gray water filtration process. Um, this system does have to be cleaned. We try to flush out our system at least twice a year. Um, and sometimes the filtration process needs a little bit of help. So we'll just add um, a couple scoops of some organic microbes into the filters to help that filtration process go a little bit faster. Um, it's really important that the, the little microbe ecosystem in these filters stays healthy in order to, to help that filtration process continue. Um, on this side, you can see we have a couple more filters. Um, this system is currently not connected. This is our future rainwater to potable system. Uh, currently in the state of California, we are not allowed to run our rainwater to potable system. Um, that's due to state regulations. Uh, they won't allow it currently, but we're working on that process and, and helping to move some legislation and get that process forward. Right now we're actually in the men's restroom. Um, I wanted to show you all kind of what that toilet sounds like. Um, this is the toilet, it's just a normal toilet, and then it has a release button here. So when you push that button, you can hear the vacuum uh, working, and then basically it'll just fill back up with water. This is the other side of our open office area. Um, you can see it's similar to the other side. Um, what we have in our office, we have a couple of, of interesting things that I'd like to point out. Um, you can see this gray soft tube going across the, the ceiling here. That is called a duct sock. And we utilize that to uh, help ensure that the mechanical system is blowing air evenly across the entire space. So all it is is a soft sock, essentially, that has perforated holes across, and it connects to, um, you know, a normal duct across our, our ventilation system, and it'll inflate when it's on, and it'll deflate when it's off. Um, and this helps keep the temperature um, consistent across the space. Another thing I would like to point out on this uh, particular side of the office um, is you can see we have some um, workstations that have missing pieces. Um, that is because um, as part of the living building challenge says that you must um, adhere to the red list when sourcing materials and bringing materials into your building. Um, the red list is a list of uh, chemical classes that are known to cause hum uh, harm to human health. We salvaged these workstations from one of our um, previous locations and we utilized them in this space um, specifically so we could keep the amount of materials that we were bringing into this space, you know, consistent with that red list and making sure that we're not bringing in new furniture that's going to be off gassing and harming people. Um, and that's, that's part of the challenge for Living Building Challenge is sourcing all of those materials. Behind me you can see our two 5,000 gallon rainwater cisterns. They, um, they fill up from during the rainy season in Sacramento, which is generally from October to about April or May. And then we have no rain all summer. So we need this much rainwater to uh, water all of our exterior urban agriculture. Um, and we generally use almost all of it in that time frame. 
our urban agriculture, which is lavenders, we have blueberries, we have strawberries, we have grasses that can be used as medicinal plants, um, we have bamboo, um, we generally grow uh, a little garden seasonally, and uh, we have passion fruit vines, kiwis, so all kinds of plants that grow on the exterior of our building. Um, we also have a bunch of wildflowers that we've planted that help uh, promote bee pollination. Thank you very much for that tour. I think it, it's nice to see it, you know, and see other aspects of it when, from a, a video. It's a lot richer. Now, maybe it, we, we've got only about just under 15 minutes left before we close. And there's some questions that were posted there in the chat. So the first one was, one of them was on what other ch maintenance challenges have you had with such a large PV array? that is like, like dust accumulation and, and so on. What, what other challenges have you had from maintenance perspective? So I think for me, the, ma the biggest maintenance challenge is always keeping the leaves and branches cleared off of the PV. And like I mentioned before, our PV panels sit flat on our roof, which creates a little bit of a problem right. when leaves get under them because we do need the water from our roof to drain down into our roof drains and so it can create a bit of a, a water problem dust accumulation is a thing um for sure and that's why usually i'll get up there when it's raining and i'll squeegee those we have had a maintenance company come one time to clean our pv but because it's the living building challenge we cannot let any of the water that they use to clean our PV enter into our, our rainwater cisterns. And we had them come during our performance period and we did not want to risk that. And so ultimately they used our collected rainwater to clean our PV panels, which it worked great, but then you have to choose, you know, would you rather sacrifice a little bit of energy production or a little bit of water? And in our case, we did it that one time and it gave us a little bit more energy production, but ultimately water always outweighs energy production for us just because specifically we create so much energy and we need all that water that we can have. So those are mainly the maintenance challenges when it comes to the PV system. For okay. me, leaves and uh, dirt. Yes, yeah, for sure. And then the process of design, was, was the design process different when you compare it to the conventional process? Likely, yes, but how different was it? What was different about it? So I can definitely say on the Salt Lake City project also, we knew this is what we wanted from the beginning. 
So you start off doing like biophilic charrettes that are like a full day charrette. And you're really trying to understand the ecology of place, how to create the health and happiness, how to integrate people in the process. So there's a lot more planning early on and coordinating with all of the teams, which I hope everyone does anyways, but it seems like on the living building, you have everyone in the room from the very beginning and you're talking through systems and the design opportunities. You involve the city officials way early, as early as you possibly can, especially for the water pedal and see what you're allowed and what you're not allowed. There's differences in California that we've learned, like in California, when water is collected, like when water falls on the ground and then is collected or pools together, if it's on the ground, it's the state's. If it's on your roof, it's yours. In Utah, any of the water collected, whether it's on your roof or on the ground, is the state's. And they have just recently passed a thing where anyone is allowed to collect up to 2,500 gallons. So one of the big um, rain barrel tanks. So it's really like learning what you're allowed to do and working with it, but also pushing the states and the officials and policymakers to allow a little bit more of the holistic living building challenge. So we design, I think, for the ultimate goal and then Mm -hmm whether you can connect the system at the time, you kind of wait and try to make policy changes. So. Okay. Um, let me ask one more here. Was there a training element to the building occupation process? If so, how long and detailed? And is this now standard onboarding for new stuff? And how well did people pick up on the new ways of occupying? For example, when to open windows? So the thread. That's the best question. (laughs) Yes, to all of it. So we actually have a product that we use within our organization. It's called Inhabit. And what it is, is it's a gamification system where we break up into teams and we, you know, we write quizzes and we do activities in order to get points and whichever team wins the challenge they get to choose a prize or a prize is chosen for them like so for example we're doing it right now to train our occupants to move into our salt lake city office and the prize is an awesome solar panel you know that megan had chosen and it's really fun it gets very competitive but ultimately the quizzes and the activities train the Mm -hmm. occupants in a way that helps them understand how the building should run you know so a challenge might be we'll write a a quiz about you know why gray water is important or reducing the amount of potable water that you're using and then the action might be carry around in a container the amount of potable water or water that you would need through the whole day to see how much water you're actually using as a building occupant um you know so they'll have to use their water from their jug to wash their hands and flush the toilet and do those kinds of things so that they can fully understand the magnitude of what it is to a carry your own water from one place to another and b you know, how much you're actually using and how precious of a resource that is that that might be wasted. So that's kind of how we train our occupants. Okay, great stuff. I want to thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't get through all the questions, but I would urge everyone who's on this call to please get the book. I think there's a lot of other stories you'll find, in, and, and I use story loosely, but there's a lot of technical information as well on process, as well as the other lessons that were learned. So even with the the living building challenge itself and how it is structured and how, you know, the teams responded to that and how the company itself dealt with the tenants being owner, owner, owner tenants as well, how they got the rest of the stuff involved in that. So so you, you, it would be good for you to get that book. And and Megan and Erica, thank you very much for, for, for connecting and for sharing that with us and for sharing your emails as well. So for any additional questions, we can send them directly to you. So thank you very much, everybody. And we thank you for joining us. And Erica and Megan, much appreciated. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.